So I have told some of you about my uh, He's a game theorist. Uh, I've been working with him for the last few years in um, in payoff games. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, we apparently solved some some problems people care about. And uh, and so this is I'm going to present this. Thanks. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, so as Bruno told you, my name is Mateusz Skomra and I am visiting Bruno these two weeks to work on this topic of uh, discounted and mean payoff games. So the title of this talk is coming from our, our last paper about the smoothed analysis for this class of games. Uh, but uh, in reality, the, the aim of this talk is to present to you, to you a little bit about these games in general. So I will talk about the theory of these games. I want to talk a little bit about the algorithms and you know at the end, um, maybe also tell a few words about, about our paper and about the smooth analysis. So Bruno told me that this is more of an open uh, session, right? So that we can discuss and do the things that you are interested in or want to do. So I have, many, many slides here, and also like the proofs of the theorems and the techniques that we use and stuff like that. So, you know, we can uh, go only through part of them or all of them, depending on your wishes and depending on how it goes. Okay. So to begin with, um, let me outline the, the topic that we are discussing. So we will be talking about games. And this, these games will be two-player, zero-sum games that are going to be played on a directed graph, OK? OK. That are going to be played on a directed graph. So this is our arena of the game, OK? So how it works. So we have a directed graph, and we have two players, min and max. So the nodes of this graph are divided into two sets. So there are nodes controlled by player max, the square nodes on this, on this picture, one, two, and three. And there are nodes controlled by player mean, one, two, and three in circles. OK? And how do players move on? on, on well, how do players play the game? So you imagine that there is a pawn or a token or something like this. And this token is placed on one of them on one of the uh, these nodes, right? And if the, the pawn is here, uh, or maybe, let's say, suppose that the, the pawn is here on a node of player one, then player one, player me, decides what uh, to do. The mouse, so then the degree. Uh, sure. So then if we imagine that the pawn is here on this node of player mean, then player mean decides the next move, right? So they can move to the left, to this node, or they can move to the right to this node, right? Mm -hmm. And now we are, uh, for we are, uh, let's say, in the node of player two, player max here, right? And then player max decides what to do. So at this node, okay, they have only one. They have you no. Know, they also have two decisions, so they can move up to three, the, or they can move down to one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is how the game is played, right? Okay. So we have a pawn, and we move the pawn on this graph. OK, so now what are the numbers of these edges? So the numbers on the edges indicate the amount of money that mean pays to max when the pawn goes through a given edge. right? So if this is negative, then it means that the transaction goes the other way, right? So mean pays minus 1, so, my, so you know max pays 1. Okay. So in this way, the game is of zero sum, because what max gains is the same as mean loses, and what mean gains is the same as what max loses. right? So this is zero sum, great. But now is the interesting feature of this game. So the interesting feature of the games that I'm going to talk about is that we are going to suppose that the players play this for infinite time. OK? So we have this infinite movement of the pawn. And at each move of the pawn, one of the players gets sunk. And the other gets the negative of the sum, right? So of course, in this, in this, in this uh, setting, uh, well, it is a little bit hard to say what does it mean to even win such a game, right? Because you have an infinite string of payoffs, 
And you know, the sum of this can be not even defined, right? It can oscillate, it can be plus infinity, minus infinity, or whatever we want, to be honest. Okay, so this is not yet a well-defined game. So we have to like take this string of payoffs and somehow normalize it to get some finite quantity that will decide the winner. Okay, so this is formalized on this slide. So the movement of the pawn gives us an infinite path in this graph, right? So this gives us an infinite string of payoffs. So there are two criteria that we are going to look at the discounted criterion and the mean payoff criterion. So in the discounted criterion, we are given a discount factor gamma and the objective of payer max or rather the final payoff of the game is defined as this quantity. So you take each payoff at each move of the pawn and you discount them by the, by, by the gamma, right? So it's, you know, the, the second payoff is multiplied by gamma, Square is multiplied by gamma squared and so on and so forth, right? And you multiply this by one minus gamma in order to make the sequence bounded, right? Like this, this is a bounded number. This is just a number. Uh, and this is the final payable player max, right? Okay, so the idea of this comes from economics, right? So in economics, we say that if, five euros today is worth more than five euros in six months because of the inflation, right? So the inflation is like, you know, like taking like this idea that the payoffs that you receive in the future are worth less than the payoffs that you receive now. So this is captured by this criterion. And the second criterion that we can talk about is the mean payoff criterion in, in which the final payoff of the game, so the objective of player max, is to maximize this quantity, which is the long-term average base. Okay. Well, now, the, so now again, this is this is a well-defined number, simply because well, this is some sequence with capital N, and I just take the linear of this some sequence with capital. N. So what this kind of criterion uh, tries to capture? Well, it tries to capture a situation in which the player doesn't care about uh, short-term gains or losses, right? They are only interested in what happens at the end. And if they have to pay a lot of money right now to get to a good situation later, that's fine. Because this criterion completely forgets about what happens in the first 10 terms, right? For an action for any final number of terms, it simply forgets that, right? It, it's just the limiting behavior that is interesting. Okay, so uh, since the objective of max is to maximize this, well, the objective of min is to minimize this, right? So this is a zero. In the second case, does it really matter if you believe in or is believe enough? Uh, so, in general, if we have any path, this is not this may not exist as a limit. However, we will see in a moment that the truly interest in the truly interesting case, this is a limit, right? Okay, so we will just, we will say that, you know, if, when you try to play it reasonably, this will be the limit. So the limit is not, not needed, but, but if you want to define it for every possible path, then you have to take a limit. There are paths where the limit does not exist. Yeah, you can just imagine a path in the graph that the limit doesn't exist, right? You can just take a path that, you know, goes up and down and up and down in arbitrary fashion, right? If you have like, an edge with one and an edge with minus one, you can do whatever you want with this path. Yeah. No, no, the tennis will exist because. No, no, the, yeah, I just say that the limit. Yeah. Limit doesn't exist because, you know, you go for n square nodes to one and then n cube to minus one, and then, you know. So you, you can just reach, this can be, you can make this arbitrarily high and low and high and low yeah. if, if, you, if you really wish. Are you saying that limit is more natural than Linsoup, or is it the same? Uh, I mean, it will lead to the same model at the end. So uh, I guess that, you know, I've, maybe some people in some books discuss why it's limit for why it should be Linsoup, but it will lead to exactly the same solution, right? No, independently, if I ask you limit for Linsoup, the optimal thing to do will be the same. So, and it will be with limit. So. That, that's not that that's not that important. Okay, so that's the um, 
as a definition. Okay, so now it's an exercise for you. So suppose, so this is one player case. Okay, so here we are the minimizer, the circle. Okay, so this is, and imagine that we start here at one. Okay, so you are just a minimizer and you want to minimize the mean payoff criterion starting at one. So what do you do if you want to minimize the mean payoff criterion on this graph? So really you want to find the negative side first, Yeah, so we see that here, if you go one phi two, one phi two, one phi two, one phi two, then we move on this cycle with minus two, three, and minus one, which is zero. So when you just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, then the mean payoff is zero, right? Very good. And actually, this is the best you can do. You cannot make any path that, that in limit will be smaller than Z. Okay, uh, so now imagine that this is a discounted game and your discount factor is one half. So not that high. So now when my discount factor is one half, what do you supposed to do? Still, we start at one. Okay, so we have a candidate, right? We take minus two and then we stay here, right? You take minus two once and then you take one forever, right? So does this sound really like a reasonable way of playing? Right, so if we do this, if we do this, right, for this kind of factor one half, you go to three and stay there. So what do we get at the end? Just to make, you know, let us make the computation, right? So the computation is that you take this factor right, at the beginning, one minus gamma, this is always the case. So first you get minus two, and then you get one multiplied by gamma, then you get one multiplied by gamma square and so on and so forth. So you get this sum, okay? But you can evaluate this. So this is one half times minus two, this is minus one. And now we have one minus gamma times this guy, but one minus gamma times this guy is exactly gamma. Right, because this is a geometric sequence. So this is one half. So by doing this this strategy, we get minus one half. Okay, we go there, we stay there forever, we get minus one. And again, it's possible to check. I didn't make a mistake that this is actually optimal. Right? For instance, if we start going one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, as previously. Then I made the computation and we only get something like minus three over 32 or something like this. So this is much higher than minus minus. Okay, so now we see that in both of these cases, we actually used a very, very simple strategy, right? So in general, I allow you, if it's one player case, to do any path of this graph that you want, very complicated path. But we said that, well, it seems that doing simple things is enough, right? So in the mean payoff case, we just say, okay, let us just go in this cycle, one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two. And in the discounted case, we say, okay, let us go to three, and then go to three, 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 whatever. Okay, so this are, this are, these are simple optimal, optimal, optimal strategies. So now the question is, okay, uh, how can we play this? How can we play this optimally? But before, before we discuss this question, let me make a few comments about this model. So here is a little bit about the notation that I have on my slides and a few other comments. So, so the first paragraph is just the notation that on my slides, I will just assume that N is the set of vertices, that M is the number of edges. And for most of the presentation, I will just assume that the weights are integers bounded, bounded by W, just to make you know some algorithmic estimates clear. So that's the notation. So the second comment is that what I presented to you is the case of deterministic games, right? So everything is 
deterministic in this game, but you can also look at the case of stochastic games. So in the stochastic games, you have the nodes of mean, you have the nodes of max, and you also have nodes of nature. And at these nodes of nature, nature randomly moves upon according to probability distribution that the players know in advance. So if there is like a fixed probability distribution at every node and nature decides, right? So then, uh, well, it makes kind of no sense to maximize your payoff in one path. It makes more sense to optimize the expected payoff. So what you, do you get? What do you get in expectation? So this is the so-called stochastic discounted and stochastic mean payoff gains. And the theory that I'm going to present is very similar. Uh, however, the end result about smooth analysis is for deterministic games. So this is why I made all of this presentation more about deterministic games than stochastic games. And finally, the one player version. So if you just have max or if you just have mean uh, of this discounted or mean payoff games is known as Markov decision processes. So Markov decision processes is like a whole theory of how to solve them, what to do with them, and how they are useful in some applications. So nowadays, a very fashionable application of Markov decision processes is the machine learning. But apparently, there is some Markov processes that you optimize to to to, to make to make uh, to make machine learning. I don't know it much about it. I know that they are very interested in multiple algorithms to to solve. Markov decision processes. But the kind of questions that we are going to ask here are a little bit different than what interests machine learning. OK, so these are the comments. So now let us move to the theory. Right? So we have seen on this very simple example that we can solve this, this game and that the optimal way of playing is rather simple. So that, well, that gives us the leads us to the first theorem of these games. So these games were actually introduced by Shapley back in 1953. And actually, he already introduced this in a more general model, but I will not spend much time on that. So he considered the discounted games. So he was only about the discounted games. And he said the following thing. So in the discounted game, for every initial position of the pawn, the game has a value. And moreover, every player has a policy that is optimal for all positions of the pawn. So that's the theorem. And now I probably should explain this, these things in bold, right? Because it's not clear what does it mean to have a value, what is a policy, and what does it mean to be optimal. OK, so, so let, us, let us explain this. So what is a value? So value is a solution concept for a zero-sum game. So the value is defined in the following way. A value of a zero-sum game is a number, is a real number, such that for every epsilon, positive epsilon, max has a strategy that guarantees a payoff of at least lambda minus epsilon, no matter what mean does. Okay? And similarly, mean has a strategy that guarantees a payoff of at most Lambda plus epsilon, no matter what max does. Okay. So now let us reflect a little bit about this definition, right? Because this is this is like fundamental definition for zero sum games. So this definition really defines us like a solution of the game, right? So if your game has a value, has this number, then the best you can do is to try to up approach this number, right? Because if you are player max and you are facing a rational opponent who knows the game, then you know that your opponent can just play their optimal policy and they can guarantee, and you cannot do anything better than, than the value, right? Because they have a policy that guarantees that whatever you do, it will not be better than the value. So, well, your most reasonable thing is to reach the value, right? And conversely for the other play. So, like if your zero sum game has a value, I mean the, the, the value, this number is really like the solution of the game. Because it really tells you what players can do, what players can achieve. Okay. And now what, what it means for a strategy to be optimal. 
We say that the strategy is optimal if it guarantees the, the, the value with exact, right? With epsilon equals to zero. Okay, so a player has an optimal strategy if you can, if you can, if if they can guarantee the value exact without any error. Okay. And uh, if you know some concepts from game theory, then in the zero sum games, the optimal strategies is exactly the same as national equilibrium. Okay. So maybe you have heard about Nash equilibrium, the notion of Nash equilibrium. So in zero sum games, Nash equilibrium is exactly the same as optimal strategies. However, the important thing is that somehow in the zero sum case, this is a stronger solution concept. So in the non-zero sum games, if you know something about them, well, there are a game can have many Nash equilibria, and this Nash equilibria are usually not equivalent to each other. They give different payoffs. However, in the zero sum game, if you have you can have multiple Nash equilibria, but they are all the same. Every Nash equilibrium gives you the value. Okay. So in this sense, a Nash equilibrium in a zero sum game is an absolute concept of the solution. If you have a Nash equilibrium in a zero sum game, that's done, right? You, while, while in the non zero sum game, as, uh, there are many other concepts of solutions. So it's a very special. So now we understand part of this, right? So the sharp, sharp play proved that these games have value, these discounted games have value, and players have optimal strategies. Okay, but now there is this third thing. But the, the optimal strategy is a policy. So now let me define what a policy is. So a policy is a very simple function. So a policy simply takes your current vertex and tells you where to move from the current vertex. Okay. So this is a concept of, uh, of a strategy that is very um, simple and very stupid, right? Because your decision at the given node depends only on the on the current node. You don't care about your current payoff. You don't care about what the other players did. You don't care about any kind of history. You take the current position, and you and this is the only thing that you remember. Okay, so this is why policies are called stationary or memoryless strategies because they require zero memory of what happened in the past and they only depend on the current state, okay? So this is like the simplest possible strategy one could use, right? Okay. And uh, the other paragraph is just a notation remark that when you have such a, such a game, your value well, can depend on the initial position of the pawn, right? You can just imagine that your graph has two connected components and from one connected, you don't ever reach the other. So the value will actually depend on the initial position. So this is why, so this is why the value here will just, will be, by the value in this game, we usually mean the vector at each coordinate con containing the value of a given starting position, right? So I sometimes say that the value is a number, sometimes the value is this vector. In, in these games, it's like the same, right? So by overuse of notation, we use the same word for, for the vector and for the component. Okay, good. Um, so now, let us maybe try to see a little bit of the theory of these games. So uh, if you are interested, we can see how Shapley proved this here. Okay. So Shapley proved this theorem by introducing the following operator. So here is a Shapley operator of the game. And you can think of this operator as a dynamic programming operator that tells you what happens in one step of the game. Okay. So imagine that I am currently at state I and the state is controlled by max. So in a sense, you have to choose an edge that goes from I to J. And what will happen then? Well, you will receive one minus gamma times Rij, right? And then you receive gamma times whatever happens at state J. 
Do we agree? Okay. So now if you do this naively, well, among all of your edges, you, you go to an edge that gives you the maximum of this quantity, and the same goes for min, right? So this gives us this lemma. So consider now a game that is discounted game as previously, but it stops after n terms. So after n terms, end. And your payoff is what you get in this first n terms, right? Then its value is exactly the fn of zero. Okay, so let us try to see that this is the case. So let us take n equals one. So in one step, what can I do? If the game was one step, well, I just go to the edge that gives me the highest payoff if I am maximizer, right? So I just put, go to max ij of one minus gamma rij. Finish, right? But then what happens if for more than, uh, for higher n by induction? Well, I know that if I take an edge ij, I will get one minus gamma times rij plus gamma, and then the game will last n minus one terms. So this will be f n minus one. Okay, so since I know that I am going to receive this, well, I will just take an edge that maximizes this quantity. Okay. And the same goes for me. Okay, so that's the proof, right? You can check, check, check in detail that this uh, that this is, works, right? So, so by the, so by computing this fn, we know what is the value of an n stage gate. Yeah, I'm guessing this might be too technical, but uh, can you have the nodes without uh, anything without going? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I will assume I I will always assume that you always have an ongoing gauge. Yeah. So uh, for me, a directed graph is always we, that every node has an ongoing gauge. Yeah. So to simplify things, uh, sometimes people use the situation in which well you don't don't have an ongoing gauge, then you lose or something like this. Right. Uh, but I don't, don't like this. It makes some theorems don't work. So I always assume that, that they, 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 they have a, a, the next section. And in any case, you can always reduce to this situation, even in this more general. Methods. OK. So, so we know what will happen if the game stops in any terms. So that was the first observation of Chaplin, and you know it's, uh, it's just some kind of a dynamic program uh, argument. Okay, so now, so now let me make a small observation about this: is that in this n-turn game, so why, when you iterate this operator, you don't not all you not only get the value, but you can actually deduce what is the optimal strategy, right? You just take the strategy that is optimal at n minus one, and then the edge that gives you the maximum, and this is your strategy that is optimal at n. So we can just reconstruct optimal strategies by going the, by iterating this operator f and checking where, where the maxima and the minima are attained, right? But now note that these strategies are not policies because you need to know your current state and the current turn number. So you need these two pieces of information, right? Okay, so these policies are not, these strategies are not policies. Interesting. But somehow the theorem will say that when you take this finite game and you take n to infinity, suddenly your optimal strategies will become policies. Right? So even it, 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 though it seems that you know you need to have more and more and more memory, in the limit you don't have to, you have zero memory. So that's quite, quite interesting. So, so the second thing that Shapley observed is that this operator is a contraction, actually, uh, in the supremum norm with the contraction rate gap. So in particular, since this is a contraction, it has a unique fixed point, and this sequence will converge to this point. 
Okay, so here is the proof that this is a contraction. If you if you are interested in the details of the proof, right? So this is a very kind of clever proof. So basically, it says that if you take this this number and multiply this vector by this number, so it's a vector which has this number of every curve. And if you take two points y and z, so, uh, x and y, then y is smaller than x plus z. Right? Because you take the difference between them and you add y to this difference, so it's uh, add x to this difference, so it's higher than y. Right? So, the, 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 so this point is higher than this point. But this operator has the funny property that it is monotone, that if y is smaller than this, then f of y is smaller than f of x, right? Because if I put my x to be higher, if my x is higher, then this whole thing is higher. And if my x is higher here, then this whole thing is also higher, it also goes up, right? So, so this operator is monotone. If you have this, you can just add f and you still have this. But this operator also has the second funny property that f of z plus x, since z has the same value of every coordinate, well, it will, it will just go out of max and go out of mean, but multiplied by gamma. So we have this equality. And likewise, if you switch uh, y and x, then you get this inequality. So what does it mean? It mean, this means that f of y minus f of x is smaller than this. And this means the opposite. f of x minus f of y is smaller than this. So since the number is smaller than this, and the minus number is also smaller than this, so the absolute value is smaller than this. And the absolute value is exactly gamma times this. OK, and we got the contraction. <laughs> Like a clever trick to prove that this operator is a contracting operator in the subhuman norm if this can factor that. So now we know that this is a, this is a, this is a contraction. So as, as a contraction, it has a fixed point, unique fixed point, and this sequence fn of zero converges to this point. Actually, fn of x for any x converges to the, to the fixed point. Okay, so now we can conclude. The theorem of Shapley, that is the, the more precise version of this, the, the, what I announced. Okay, that if we take this point, this fixed point of this Shapley operator, then this is exactly the value vector. And moreover, moreover, what are the optimal policies? Well, the optimal policies are exactly the, the policies that achieve the max or the mean in this equation. And now we get the memorylessness, right? Because you just have this single equation and your policy is just, okay, take an edge that achieves this equation, max or mean in this equation, that's, your, that's a policy. Okay, so now let us try to prove this, that the value is exactly the fixed point of this operator. Okay, so, so, so we have already proven that this fixed point exists, okay? So max has a policy that achieves the maxima in these equations because these equations exist. So this policy exists. So now suppose that max uses this policy. So now you end up in a one player game obtained by fixing this policy. So if, if we truncate these games to n terms, then we know that the value of this truncated game is uh, this thing. Right? So the payoff that max achieves is at least this, right? Because max is at, at guaranteed this in n play, in n term game. Right? Mm -hmm. So the exactly. Well, it's at least because it doesn't depend on what you mean. So, I mean, the value is this. So the payoff that you are getting is at least this because, you know, maybe mean doesn't play optimal. Oh. So whatever, so I mean, whatever mean does, I am guaranteed at least this. 
Okay, so that's the point. Whatever I mean does, I am guaranteed at least this. Okay, so as n goes to infinity, I am guaranteed at least the fixed point of this. But what is the fixed point of this? Well, it's the lambda because this is how we defined it, right? We define sigma to be the policy such that this, this is the fixed point of this. Okay, so when I play sigma, whatever I mean does, I am guaranteed lambda. And when mean plays accordingly, we can take policy that achieves minima. And when mean uses this policy, they guarantee that the, that the pair at the end is at most lambda. Right? <clears throat> it's a little bit lost. So, so you take f sigma to be the family operator. So it's you replace whatever your input is with the maximum yes. given by the equations. Uh -huh. But now that not the so now the maximum you restrict to have yes, you restrict sigma. So yes. the maximum is just follow arrow sigma. Mm -hmm. And now the the only thing left free is the minimum. Mm -hmm. And now we have proved that if we do this for n terms, yes. the, the value that we get, the no. best that you can possibly get, right, is f sigma n of zero. Yes, but now it's the best for mean because it's the only mean place. And now it's the best for mean. Right? So no matter what mean does. After n terms, you can after n terms, it's at least this amount. Maybe there's a maybe one inequality, but you can say that f sigma of you know to the power of n is at least f to the power of n. Is that correct? Same the f that you need before. No, no, it's not true, right? But I right, because f because f is uh, no, no, I, 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 no, f, f. Of f of x is always greater than f sigma of x. Okay, yeah. uh, that's the inequality. Yeah. The inequality is in this sense. Now, what I want to say here is that is that I restricted the game to playing only sigma. So now you look at this one player game. So only min plays. Yeah. Okay. So now the value of this n turn games is the smallest thing that min can achieve. So the smallest thing that mean can achieve is this. Correct. Okay. So in n terms, that's what you can get. So this is the smallest that mean can get a, 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 while facing sigma. The okay. smallest thing in n terms. Yeah. But this is still a contraction. Of course. I mean, we have proven this for two players, so the one player case follows uh, immediately, right? Uh, yeah, so this is, so, so in n terms, Whatever you do in n terms, it's smaller than this. So now you go with n to infinity. So whatever you do, the limit will be smaller than uh, the fixed point. Right, but the, but the way you reason is because this is a contraction, when you take the limit of any point, you always convert, is a strict contraction. So you always converge to the unique fixed point. Yes. And the unique fixed point is actually of this guy is actually lambda. Yes, and the unique fixed point of this guy is lambda because this is how we define the sigma. The sigma is the policy that achieves maxima here. So in particular, lambda is the fixed point of this. Okay. This is this is now okay. Yeah, that's that's the proof. Okay. And then you can prove the opposite, that these are the, the only policies that are optimal in the things that achieve the maximum mean. Because you know, if you use a policy that is not achieving max or mean, then lambda is not the fixed point, right? So then when the other guy takes a policy that does achieve the max or mean or max, you get a different fixed point that is smaller, strictly smaller or greater at, at least max, okay? Right? So, so, so actually, the optimal policies are exactly the policies given that by means and the price. Is that believable? 
if max has a policy that doesn't use the edges that achieve the maximum yes okay yes so imagine that mean uses the policy that achieves the minimum yes so now when you fix when you look at the zero player operator the, the the lambda is not a fixed point fix the mean strategy to be the the optimal one according yeah. to the fixed point there and the other one is not some other strategy yeah so that means that for one of the maxes one of the nodes i the player max chooses the an edge which is not maximum yeah so the so the, the so the fixed point is not this Right. The fixed point is... So the fixed point of the zero player thingy is not lambda because no, I want to prove so. I want to prove that if a policy of max does not use an edge that achieves the maximum, yeah, then this policy is not optimal, meaning the value that it attains is less than lambda. Yes. Um, no, 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 no. Okay, let us. Or maybe there are multiple edges that achieve the maximum. Okay. Yes, but they may be, but the but we. Yes, I I want to say that the policy is optimal if and only if it uses such edges. Okay, so let me, if I do stop share. Yes. Do you see me? Okay. Right. So now we said. Okay. Suppose. Edge such that such that um what do I have? Okay. so now I don't see my own slide but okay this is not maximum of I uh, I maybe okay we put J here this is not maximum of I J of my T which was one minus gamma per I J plus gamma uh, lambda G. Okay, so suppose let me use an optimal a policy that achieves the mean. And you want to pair them against each other, right? So now, I want to prove that the value that is less than the value that is attained at this node lambda i is less. That okay. this node i is less than lambda i. So now the value. Achieved by this game. Is, well, this is zero player game, right? Zero player because each vertex has only one. Okay, well, the game that I obtained by fixing a policy, let's say tau. So you have sigma and tau fixed. So now if I fix sigma and tau, I get the zero player game is the fixed point okay. of my Shapley operator. F with restricted to sigma and tau. Do we agree? Now, I claim that since since mean uses an optimal policy, and you agreed that this gives you an optimal policy. Yes. This fixed point, the uh, fixed point, call it. Okay, let us call it lambda. We have well, this thing.
we have this, right? Because I use my optimal policy, so I am guaranteed that the, I am the minimizer. So I am guaranteed that the payoff is at the most long. There we go. Okay. But lambda is not this. It is not. Yeah. Not a fixed point of F sigma tau. Of F sigma tau. Because right? Because this is what we said about sigma. Sigma uses an edge that doesn't achieve the maximum, which means that if I plug in lambda to these equations, I do not get equality. Okay? So the corollary is that lambda sigma tau i is strictly smaller than lambda i for at least. So sigma is not optimal. Or at least not uniformly optimal, right? There exists a node for which it is not optimal. Okay, but that the thing about here about optimality, which is okay, a technical point, but maybe an interesting technical point, is that you have policies that are optimal for all starting position, right? Uh, po your policy is optimal for all starting position, not for all starting position, there exists an optimal policy. There is a stronger thing. Uh, and you have an optimal policy that is optimal for all starting position. Okay. Is it fine? Okay, good. So let me maybe go back to sharing. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, good. Good. So now we know that the discounted games have um, have uh, optimal policies and the value. So now a few, let's say, technical points. What can we say about this value? Okay. So maybe before this technical points, let me make a remark. Uh, let me make a remark. So we have proved we have proven the existence of optimal policies, but our proof is uh, well, somehow uh, uh, no, it's not completely non-constructive, but somehow existential, right? They say, well, you know, this fixed point has to exist, so I have these policies which have to exist. We can use uh, repeated iteration to convert. Yeah, we can use repeat, but it already suggests an algorithm, right? You could use repeated iteration to find them, right? So we will discuss the algorithm later. Um, but but it is still a little bit existential, but it but yes, it suggested suggests at least one algorithm to actually find. Okay, so let me make a few observations. Okay. So uh so the observation is that you know if your payoffs are integer bounded by uh, w, then the uh, value of the game is still bounded by w, and it comes from this trivial inequality, right? So you have the a bound on the value. That's why you need the one minus gamma. Yes, yes, that's why I, that, that this is the real reason why I need it. So to, to make it bound. Right? No. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the normalizing factor just to make it smaller than that. So they, this is useful, but yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it's for the theory. It's so now, but now that we know as a computer scientist, we should ask ourselves a question, like, can we compute this stuff, right? Uh, so suppose, so what can you say about this value? So suppose that I had a pair of optimal policies, because now uh, by, by the previous proof, it's not even like obvious, that even if my payoffs are integers, is it true that the value is a rational number, right? Right. It could be maybe irrational because it's just some kind of fixed point. So let us prove that this is actually not the case. So suppose that lambda and tau is a pair of optimal policies. So now 
The value is what? Well, the value is a unique solution to this system of equations, right? For each node, I have one equation like this. But this is a linear system. If you fix, if you fix gamma, this is a linear system. So since this is a linear system with a unique solution, so and uh, payoffs are integers. So if I assume that gamma is rational, then the solution is also rational because it's a solution of a linear system. So you can compute it by like Kramer's rule, Gaussian elimination, or whatever, and you will get a rational number at the end. Okay. Oof. So the value is not only exists; it is a rational vector. Very nice. It is also a rational vector. And if you do this Kramer's rule estimate or whatever precisely. You can estimate the number of bits that you need for the value. So if the if the discount factor is p over q, then the coordinates of these values of this value are rational numbers that are between minus w and w, because this is how uh, the value is estimated, and the denominators are bounded by this quantity. Because you do the Kramer's rule, you estimate the determinants and uh, or you do some other proof, okay? Like there is some proof. But this, how many bits do you need to specify this? Well, it's polynomial, right? Polynomial in many bits in the input. So it's a very reasonable question to ask. If I give you a graph, and again, can you find me the value? Right? Good. Okay. So what can we say about this algorithmic question? Well. So the first problem, let us look at the decision problem. So in the decision problem, we just want to decide if the value on one coordinate is positive or not. And so let us observe that this is in NP and in co-NP. And even better, it's in UP and co-UP. Uh, so what's the proof? Well, the value of your game, this vector, is a, is a certificate that you can use to your non-deterministic machine. Even more, it's a unique certificate that you can use for your non-deterministic machine, right? Because if I give you a vector, you can very easily check that it is a value. Just plug in the fixed point equations, check if they are satisfied, if yes, yes, if no, no. End of story. So this certificate certifies you the belonging to NP, but it's also, so it certifies that the answer is yes, but it also certifies that the answer is no. So your problem belongs to both NP and to co-NP, and I, even UP and to co-UP, because it certifies both answers, right? So, you know, the most natural question, well, is it polytime decidable? Okay? And as it turns out, even though this model is so simple and has such a beautiful, beautiful properties, and it was introduced in, by Shapley in the 50s, we have no idea if we can solve these games actually in polynomial time. So this has been proposed as an open problem, and it's like deeply studied as an open problem for the past 35 years or so. And the, two, and the best bound that we have is that if you fix the discount rate, then yeah, then we can do this in polynomial time, very nice. If you don't fix the discount rate, then the best we can do is a randomized sub-exponential time algorithm with complexity independent on the discount factor. Like two to the root n, right? Two to the root n times log n. What do you mean by not fixing that? Sorry? What do you mean by not fixing the, uh, the, the discount factor? I mean, it's it's like, how do you say? It? It's like strongly sub-exponential, right? So the number of iterations depend on the size of the graph, but not on the discount factor. So it's two to the power two to the power square root of n, independent of the discount factor. So your discount factor can be very close to one, but it's still two to the square root of n. Okay. The what also finally is what it also will do the value. The value also does not depend on that. But the number of bits depends, right? But you don't think the value is independent. The value, the value should depend on 
Yes, yes the value yeah. depends. Yes, yes, the value depends. Yes. So, you you give the you give as an input a graph in gamma, and as output you get the the value, yeah. right? But the number of arithmetic operations will not depend on the gamma. Okay, so this is this is the best we can do. So this is well. So already we know that this belongs to NP and CoUP. Uh, this decision problem, but also we can say well, it's a problem about finding a fixed point. So this there is like this class of uh, search problems in NP TFNP, right? So this is the problems where people are interested in, I like in finding fixed points of Gruber maps or or things like that, like Nash equilibria and stuff, right? So people came up with the whole stratification of this class of search problems. So we have a lot of classes, PPA, PPA, DCLS, uh, UAOPL, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that this problem of solving game belongs to all of them. Okay? So, you know, people make all of this, all of these classes and deterministic or even stochastic games belong everywhere. They belong to NP, CoUP, and so on. And here we still don't know if this is polynomial density. So, you know, one could argue that this is one of maybe the easiest problem in NP, which is not known to be in P, right? And it has this, this kind of beautiful property that it is like in NP and CoNP, but it's like extremely symmetric, right? Uh, like the, the value is certificated both at the same time. If you know other problems in NP and CoNP, like factoring problem, right? Then like one, uh, like like usually like one direction has a different certificate than the other direction, right? If you want to know if your number has five factors and if I give you them, then you know it has five factors, but the opposite certificate is something complicated and I have no idea what it is, right? I know it exists. Uh, but here it's very symmetric. Okay, so this is the the theory of discounted games. But now we also had this other criterion, the mean payoff games, right? So what can we say about the mean payoff games? So so we can also use a Shapley operator. So this is the same thing as before. Well, not the same. So this operator also tries to tell you what happens in one go. So in the mean payoff game, when we, what happens in one go is, well, you can just choose an edge that gives you the maximum or choose an edge that gives you a minimum and, and hope that it somehow gives you something. So there is this theorem that says that, well, mean payoff games behave in a similar way. So mean payoff games also have value and have optimal policies just as the discounted gains. But now the value is a little bit more hard to characterize. So there is no like a fixed point equation, but the value is, is equal to these two limits. So the first limit is the value of the discounted gain when the discount factor goes to one, okay? So in this sense, we can think of this mean pair of gains as discounted gains with discount factor going to one at least in the sense of the, the, this, this theorem, that the value will go. And, and there is something similar going on with the Shapley operator. So in the Shapley operator in the discounted games, we saw that iterating the operator goes to the value, but here it will not go to the value, you need to normalize it. But when you iterate and normalize it, and then the limit exists and it is also the value, okay? So this is the theorem about mean payoff case. So it's more complicated to analyze and it took people more time to do this. So here is a little bit of the story of this theorem. So the first person to consider mean payoff criterion was Gillette a few years after Shapley in 57. So he was considering this model with mean payoff games also in the stochastic version. And he claimed a proof that mean optimal policies exist in this case. However, his proof was incorrect. So then Liget and Lipman in 69 corrected the proof. So they gave a correct proof. 
However, this were this was happening in let's say math game theory community before computer scientists discovered these games. So then the games were rediscovered. Uh, so in particular, uh, the deterministic case was rediscovered by Aaron Freud and Michelski in '79, and then they gave the proof of optimality. And then other computer scientists rediscovered or discovered some similar classes of games, like Park games, simple stochastic games. And they also, you know, sometimes gave a proof, sometimes, sometimes referred to some other proof. Uh, it's a little bit of a mess. Uh, but, but, but nowadays we understand the history. And this equality uh, that these two things are equal and equal to the value. I mean, it's hard to say, but uh, Berle and Colbert proved this in a much more general model, so we can trace it at least to 76, possibly further, uh, to the past. Okay. So now I wanted to present you maybe some bits of the proof of this of this theorem, which, as I told you, is more complicated. Um, so the proof that I have on the slides have four steps. So first of all, we will analyze what happens to discounted games as the discount rate goes to one. Then we will analyze what happens on one player in pair of games. By combining these two things, we can decide to de deduce the existence of optimal policies. And at the end, we can prove this equality for the value vector. So this is, these are the four steps. And uh, well, all proofs of optimality uh, require a few steps. I don't know any like very simple proof. This is maybe not the simplest proof. But it uh, kind of uses the tools that we later use with Bruno to study smooth analysis. So it introduces a lot of uh, useful, uh, useful knowledge. OK. So as I told you, this mean pair of games, we can think of them as discounted games with discount factor very close to one. So let me now make this formal. So we will make the following definition. We will say that the policy is Blackwell optimal if it is optimal for all discount factors that are close to one? Is this fine? I can definish. So first thing first is, well, it's maybe not obvious even that such a policy could exist, right? That you have a policy that is optimal for all discount factors that are close to one. OK? So Liggett and Lippmann, like as the first part of the proof, proved exactly that. So they say, well, OK, we will prove that a discounted game has a pair of backward optimal policies. So, and even they proved something even more, that there exists a number smaller than one that we will call the Blackwell threshold for the game with the following property. If your policy is optimal for any discount factor higher than this number, then it is black hole optimal. Okay? So when you take a game and the discount factor is higher than the Blackwell threshold, then every optimal policy is optimal for all higher discount factors. So in some sense, at this, at this discount factor, the game stabilizes. Nothing changes afterwards. Okay? OK, so let us do the proof. So the proof can fit on one slide if we allow ourselves to use a little bit of a mathematical hammer. OK? So here is the abstract proof that this has to exist. OK, so given a pair of policies, we'll consider the following set. We'll consider all discount factors such that these policies are optimal. Okay, so given a pair of policies, this is some subset of 0, 1. Do we agree? It's just some subset, right? So now, how is this subset characterized? Well, a discount factor belongs to the set if and only if the following system of inequalities has a solution, right? So we have to say that the value of this, uh, yeah, that the value of the game 
has the property that the maxima and minima are achieved by sigma and tau. So these are the equations for the value, right? This. This has to be satisfied by the value no matter what, these two things, right? Xi is supposed to be equal to maximum. Uh, so it has to be greater than everybody uh, for i in v max. For i in v, in v mean, xi has to be equal to the minimum, so it has to be smaller than everybody, right? But now if you want to equality to max or to mean, I have to assume that, well, at least one of these things is always satisfied as equality, right? But if I assume that the things that satisfy equalities are precisely the edges used by sigma and tau, then that means that sigma and tau are optimal, right? Because x here is a fixed point of the Shapley equations and the maxima and minima are achieved by sigma and tau and conversely, right? Okay? So the set of discount factors such that sigma and tau are optimal is exactly the set of this sum factor such that this system has a solution. Do we agree with that? Okay, good. So now let us use a mathematical hammer. Okay, so this thing, if you think about this as a set of gamma and x, so it is in Rn to the n plus one. You think of this as a subset of R and to the, R to the n plus one, where the first coordinates and coordinates are x, and the last one is gamma. Yes, exactly. So this thing here defines a semi-algebraic set. Set defined by polynomial inequalities. Right. Very well. So now this set <laughs> is a projection on gamma of this set. Correct. Correct. So by Tarsus quantified elimination, it is also semi-algebraic. A projection of a semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic. That's the quantifier elimination. Yes? Yes. Good. So this is a one-dimensional semi-algebraic set. OK. But what are one-dimensional semi-algebraic sets? These are precisely the unions of points and intervals. Do we agree? OK. So, so we have, for every pair sigma tau, this is a union of points and intervals. For every sigma tau, this is a union of points and intervals. The set of discount factors that are optimal for sigma tau, uh, such that sigma tau are optimal for this discount factor, is this union of points and intervals. Yes. yes. OK. So, so now take all of them, all of I, all of this set. Now look at all the so you have all of these intervals and points. So we, and you take all of the endpoints of all of these intervals. Very good. Okay. So you chopped out. So you chopped zero one into many many small intervals. Okay. So take the last point that is not one. So you take this as your Blackwell threshold. Uh, you take the last point that is not one. So, okay. Because what happens if I have a discount factor greater than this last point? Well, it has to belong to one of these sets, right? To I sigma tau. But now this I sigma tau has to be, uh, well, it is a union of intervals. And it's higher than the last possible endpoint. So this interval, the this interval has to contain the whole thing from start out to one. Yes. Yes. So we it's not. not <laughs> Uh, wait. Uh, so you're saying that the largest such point uh -huh. 
Yeah, because you know, it's uh, if you look at the definition, you can have open intervals, right? In the semi algebraic set. So we just so we just so we just add the endpoints. Even if the intervals are open, I will add them to my collection of points. No, but what I don't understand is why the last because every number between zero and one has to be in one of these semi algebraic sets. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, because for every Except for every gamma, you have a pair of optimal policies, right? So you're saying that for every gamma, you have a pair of optimal policies. Very good. Mm -hmm. And now let's take the for the for the for the for the you mean, I see. So you've broken this down, you put some marker there, you pick the last marker before one. Mm -hmm. And now you say, of course, there exists for all the gamma after this, there is some policy mm -hmm. which is optimal for this, mm -hmm. for this gamma. But that policy can't change because this interval is contained good. But why? Oh, then the policy that is, and this policy is not optimal for that entire range. Yes, yes. it's optimal from gamma star to the end. Okay. Yeah. So we have proven that this exists. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we have proven that Blackwell optimal policy exists. But yes, okay, we use the canon, but okay, I mean, it's quantifier information is nice. So this is not just the behavior that's close to one. Sorry? This is not just the behavior that's close to one. There are only like finitely many. Okay, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, there are only finitely many phases. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we know this. So now let us see what happens close to R. So now I claim that now this limit exists, whatever it is. And even more, the value of the game for this gamma close to R can be developed into a power series. Right, so this, this function which may be complicated, actually converges at one, even though it's defined only for zero, one open, I can prolong it to one. And even more, at one, I can develop it into a power series. So it's like analytical at one. Right? Even though I define it only on the open interval, it has like an analytical extension to one. So let us see why this is true. So let us take a pair of Blackwell optimal policies, right? So the value given by this pair is the value of the game, because there are optimal. But the value, well, is a solution of a linear system. We have seen that, right? So by, by now, if the, if the distance factor changes, but it's, you know, above the Blackwell threshold, right? So, by the Kramer rule, the value near one is a rational function of gamma. Because, well, a solu the solution of the system is some kind of determinant divided by determinant, and these determinants depend on gamma. Right? So, this is a rational function of gamma. Okay, rational function of gamma. But now, what is the property of a rational function? Wait, a rational function can be always developed into a Laurent series, even at the pole. So there's so the system linear equations have some a uh, a x equals b. Mm -hmm. uh, blah, 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 blah. So what is the a? The a is the one in the gamma, right? In this equation, what's the matrix there? Yeah, it's the one minus gamma on the edges, right? Uh, you, you, so the and gamma. The other row has a one, 
and the minus gamma. gamma. Yeah. And minus gamma position J. J. Yes, exactly. And what is B? B is one minus gamma R J. Exactly. We have a solution of AX equals B. Yes, you have a solution of A is equal to Yeah. And of course, this is the inverse of A times B. Yeah. So you have a few inverses of A using frame Uh-huh. And that's some 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 two determinants. Yep. So that's some two determinants. Yeah. And the determinants is what just some polynomial in polynomial uh, in a yeah. It's polynomial in gamma. Okay. If you they fix R and you only change gamma, right? Oh, because you fix R and you only change gamma. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is a polynomial in gamma. So it's a polynomial in gamma. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is this is the fraction of the polynomials in gamma. It's a fraction of the polynomials. Another way is that. So it's a rational function. Any such function can be written as a long series, yeah. Which I don't know why. But okay, fine. It's just the property of rational function. <laughs> a Laurent series form a field, right? As there's this theorem that Laurent series form a field. Mm, okay. So the polynomial is obviously a Laurent series. <clears throat> exactly. Fields now. Yeah, yeah. If you know complex analysis, then we know in complex analysis, people are taught that you know a meromorphic function can be developed into the Laurent series. But it's just a theorem. But you analyzes that the Laurent that you can even at the pole you can you can develop them into the Laurent series. Okay. Okay, so this is so this has a development into the Laurent series, but everything oh, is so existential here. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes, but, but 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 so it's a Laurent series that can have like negative powers. It can be a pole a priori. A priori, it can be a pole. But we know that this function is bounded everywhere by W, so it cannot have a pole at one, right? Because the rational function at the pole explodes. So it doesn't have a pole. So a rational function that doesn't have a pole is like this. It's actually a, just a tail of series. Yeah, everything here is very existential. <coughs> okay, so do we agree? Okay, so now we have this development into uh, Laurent series, but in particular, it means that it has a limit. C0 is the limit. Yeah. Because well, we have proven so this proof, sorry, this proof proves so you have the Laurent development. You say, well, but this is bounded, so actually I cannot have negative powers here. So I only have non-negative powers, but so in particular I have the limit, right? Okay, so that's that's the limit. Okay, do we agree? So we have proven that actually this function can be extended to one and even analytic to one. And it has its development into the irrations. Yeah, uh, okay, so that's how games behave at one. So at one, they uh, behave nicely. Okay, so that's the first part of the proof. It's funny because you always argue like you think the, you think the witness, right? Which sometimes means you take the, the value and then you argue, oh, if the value exists, and proven it by some fixed point theorem. So let's take it and do some other manipulations. Sometimes yeah. you prove it like this. And sometimes the proof is like, oh, well, we know the policies exist, so let's take the policy and do something. Yes. <laughs> but uh, so so this is like this is important for us in the complexity theory. Because you know, like the, the part where the, the algorithm would have been easy is always skipped by arguing like this. Take the witness and I'll do something with the witness, right? But this take the witness part is the whole is the whole conundrum. Can you actually find the value or can you find the whole? So, but the arguments always happen like post algorithmic Like, suppose that somehow we got our hands on the witness, and now we argue. Right? Uh, which is like magical for me, like because really the proofs are much more the proofs are useful and much more constructive, like right. So well, you know, there's this process, we use some new sun and we invert and da, 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 and something comes out, and now you argue somehow about this process. And this is this field is somehow magical, at least so far. So me and Matilda are actually trying to find this argument, but we have completely failed to do this at this point. 
But this should sound magical because all we are all we are doing is by duality. We always say we know that these objects exist, we put it back essentially by some fixed point. But we although we can never know, we can never actually we don't have an algorithm to get our hands on it, but well we have to have an exponential time. But we know they exist, so everything we're gonna do is gonna be like okay, give me the object now. This is <laughs> So, so the, I consider this like a very special feature of this. You're always arguing based on duality. Mm -hmm. okay. This is the perfect example, right? So uh, because there's some optimal policy, bam, we give them the object that exists in fixed point argument and it exists now. Well, now we have this very simple everything you need. We have a new system, we this rule, and then and then. So, like once you give me the objects, I can develop this. Kind of quickly, right? Because there's algorithms to do all this, right? Finding the solution, take the determinant, expand the determinant to the powers you need, blah, 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 blah. All of that is fine. This initial step, which is just this one little sentence, is so, so innocent, but like, let there be that we have no idea what to do. And it's kind of magical because even though we don't know how to find those innocent looking sigma and tau, that's really tricky. Once we have it in our hands, we can start and say all sorts of interesting and nice things. Okay, so now we understand what happens as this scale factor goes to one, right? So now let us switch gears for the moment and let us analyze one player game. Okay, so suppose you are in a min payoff game and we want to maximize this quantity, right? So now I will just do a more standard type of an argument. So what is the best you can do in this one player game? So now this proposition claims that the best you can do is to find the cycle with the highest mean, mean weight, go to this cycle and stay there forever. Oh, if it's a one-player game, sure. Right, one-player one play game, yeah. So in particular, the value of this one-player game is the highest mean weight of any cycle that is reachable from your node. And moreover, there exists a policy that will do this for you. So that's like a taking pattern, right? And the same if you're a minimizer. You need to go to Okay, so, so now I, I say two things. So your best strategy, like abstractly speaking. So I'm in one player game, there's only yes. maximizing nodes. Yes. All the others have a fail. Yes. I want to know the mean uh mean payoff, the mean the value of the mean payoff game. Yes, for payoff. this maximum. Right. So what so what we want to do is indeed maximize the length of the payoffs that I get on this infinite path. Yes. Yes. So you have this infinite path, and I say that actually your optimal thing is just to go to the cycle and stay in the cycle. Okay, so this is only one very particular path. So that's the first part. But the second part that I argue is that actually you can do this using a policy. Right, which, you know, it's like, it has to be proved. Okay, so let us prove this. So obviously, Obviously, I can go, I can find the cycle and go to the cycle. So this is a strategy that guarantees me at least the highest payoff of any cycle. Right? So it's only the opposite that we have to argue, that you cannot do any better. Is this okay? Oh. Okay. So now there is a very nice reason. So suppose that you, you do something. So you do some path. Okay. Without any knowledge of what it is, we just go through the graph and accumulate paths. And I will do the following things. Think. Once you go through an edge, you will put these edges on two stacks. There will be two stacks of edges. And you do the following. You take your edge that you have just crossed and you put it on your first stack. Okay? And then you look at your first stack. And if it so happens that on the top of your stack you have a cycle, you take these edges out and put them on the second stack. 
Okay, so we take an edge, put it on the first stack, check if there is a cycle there. If yes, take this cycle out, put it on the second. So on the second stack, you only have cycles. So what happens on the first stack? So there are two observations. On the first stack, you always have a valid path. Yes, because once you did a loop, you took out the loop. So when you continue, you are still having a path. But what does it mean? It means that your stack is at height and at most n, right? Because when you have more than n, or rather n minus one, right? If you have n, then you already have a cycle. So your first stack is at most n minus one. So the total weight is at most this quantity on your first stack. But what happens on the second stack? Well, on the second stack, you only have cycles. So the mean, but the mean weight of any cycle is smaller than the maximum. So I can just replace every payoff on the second stack by the mean value, and I will get something higher. So this, so on the second stack, we have at most this. So in total, we have at most this plus this. So in mean mean, it's at most lambda plus this divided by n. So you cannot do, in the limit, you cannot do any better than you. Very nice. So my strategy, go to the cycle, stay in the cycle, is optimal. And now, well, you need some kind of stupid graph theory argument that this is actually a policy. Right? Well, by maybe you can go to the cycle in many different ways, right? So it's not, if I just said this like this, it's not a policy. Yeah. Right? Oh, so you have to oh, exhibit uh, the fact that this is a police, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. So this is a kind of an argument, right? You find the cycle with the highest mean, collapse this to a vertex, you use BFS to find all vertices that can reach the cycle. This gives you a tree. You remove this tree from a graph, you repeat. And that, like this, you got the police. I agree that there's a policy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but you know, it, it requires a proof. If you are very, very precise, it requires a proof that this is a police. Right. Good. Well, OK, so we've solved one player case that was easy. And we know what happens as gamma goes to 1. OK, so we know these two things. And now I will combine them to get optimal policies, right? So this is what Rickett and Rickman did. We're using a little bit of a different argument. But OK, but they said that Blackwell optimal policies are optimal in the mean pair of gates. So if you are optimal for all high discount factors, you are optimal in the mean. And the value is equal to this limit of this country. So now let us try to prove this. So again, as always, let us say that Max uses a black hole optimal policy. OK, so the best response of mean, we have already seen this, is to use the policy. right? So if I fix sigma, now I have one player problem. So the best thing that we can do is to use a policy that goes to the lowest cycle. right? So it's still the policy. Uh, good. So now what happens when we fix sigma and tau? So when you fix sigma and tau, well, the pawn moves along some path that ends in a cycle. So the mean final payoff is the mean weight of this cycle. OK, so this is the mean phase. But what happens in the discounted case? So for all gamma near 1, the discounted payoff is at least this thing because sigma is black hole optimal. Like sigma is black hole optimal, so it guarantees at least this thing, whatever mean does. So in particular, if mean uses tau, we are guaranteed at least this. But now we can just write this expression explicitly, right? This discounted payoff on this one zero player game is exactly equal to this expression. So this is what happens on the path. Yes. Ah. And then we go in a cycle. So this is one minus gamma times this is what happens on the cycle, but uh, and then that's the first time you go. Oh, I of course forgot, I of course forgot gamma to the power k plus one. Gamma to the, uh, power. the slides cannot be here. Gamma to the power k plus one times the equation. 
Well, right. So we're going to yeah. have because after K, <coughs> yes. Gamma. Okay, so what happens is when you try to go for the first time on this cycle? So you get gamma to the power k plus one times this, plus blah 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 plus gamma to the power k plus one times this. Yeah. But then the cycle repeats. So you get this once, but then you get this gamma to the power L, and this is the length of the cycle, times this thing, plus gamma to the power L times this thing, plus blah blah blah. blah right? yeah. So you know, after correcting your slides, this is the expression. And this expression, uh, S gamma equals one. Okay. Yeah, so the discounted pair is at least this big. And then you check that this thing actually converges to, right? So this limit. What? The mean weight of the cycle. Oh, to the mean weight of the cycle of the steps. So yeah, so this phi, this phi e is greater than lambda. Because this is the discounted payoff is greater than lambda discount. For the interaction, yes. This phi e is greater than lambda discount. Okay? Yes. So now I go to the limit. This limit exists, we have proven that, but this limit is exactly the limit. After you do the computation. This thing disappears, the path disappears completely, and then you just compute this. And you get that this is actually the mean. So we got that this is greater than this. Okay. So but now, so what does it mean? That when Max uses sigma, the mean weight of any cycle is at least this limit. Oh, right. so the mean can't do better than that. So the mean can't do better than that. And analogously, if mean uses black and optimal policy, then you get the opposite inequality. Right? So this is the value of the mean pair gain and black and optimal policy, the optimal. Right? Okay, so the only thing to do here is yes. It just to check that this So you take a black of optimal policy for max and min, and you've proven that they are truly their policies and they're truly optimal, meaning anything that the other player does, he cannot get better than this limit for himself. Mm -hmm. And so the game has a value, and it actually equals this limit. Exactly. The, I mean, the mean payoff game has a value. Mm -hmm. And then it's Yep. Okay. So that's the, 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 the so that's somehow what we get the Nipa did, right? Uh, so we have almost finished, right? The only thing that remains to be proven in this theorem is that this is actually this other limit, the limit with the Shapley operator. Okay. So uh, let us let us prove this as well to for completeness. Uh, so recall that this is a Shapley operator. Yes. So now I claim that the value of mean pay of game that starts in n terms is exactly the you know nth iterate of this. You can divide by n if you want the average payoff, but if you want the total payoff, you don't divide by n. And the proof is well same as in the discounted case, same the, the like. Uh, dynamic programming argument, right? Well, you know what is going to happen in n terms, so you know in n minus one terms, so you just take the edge that gives you a maximum or a minimum, and and this is how you maximize the total payoff, but maximizing, but in finite case, maximizing average and total is the same, right? Because it's just factor of n, right? So that's the same. So it's a payoff of the of the n n term game. So that's the same argument. So now let us uh, prove this, this, this estimate. So now I claim that if you take the value of the mean payoff gain, it satisfies this inequality. So the value of, well, rather than this average operator is sandwiched between the value plus minus something small. Okay? And in particular, if you take this, then in the limit you get 
well, you get that this limit exists and is equal to lambda. So that's the final part of the theorem. Right? Okay. Uh, so what would be the proof of this inequality? So here we suppose that Max again uses some optimal policy in the Minpei game. And now you suppose that you are using your policy that is optimal in Minpei, but you use it in the truncated game. So in the truncated end step game, it may not be optimal. Okay. Uh, however, you can still use the same kind of reasoning with two stacks. So you use this policy. Max uses a policy. So now mean does sum. Right? So now you have your two stacks. Same argument, right? So what is on the first stack? On the first stack, you have at most this thing. Okay? But what do you have on the second stack? Well, on the second stack, you have cycles. You have at least uh, at least minus. Uh, sorry, yes, you have at least this thing, right? Because you have a stack of length n minus one with uh, everything, but there is uh, at least minus w. Yes. So you have at least this thing. But now on the second stack, you have cycles. By, but by optimality of, of sigma. Uh, sigma is optimal in the mean pair game. So every of this cycle is at least uh, yes. Every of this cycle has mean at least this, at least uh, at least uh, gamma i zero, right? And this is the number of edges that you have on the second stack. So you have at least this many edges on the second stack. And if you replace everybody by uh, gamma, by, by lambda, uh, then it gives you the uh, lower bound on your pair. OK? Right? Because every mean, the mean of every cycle is at least lambda i0. So if you replace every edge on this second stack by lambda i zero, you only make it smaller. Okay, so you got by using sigma, which may not be optimal, you got at least this, which is which is this quantity. Okay. Sigma, may not be sigma. sigma is optimal in the mean payoff, but you use it in a truncated game, Almost. right? Yeah, but you still get it. Okay, but 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 the value of a truncated game, as we just said, is at least this thing, right? Because that's the value of the truncated game. So we get that this thing is at least this, because in this truncated game you can do better than sigma, so we can get higher payoff than this. Okay, and same for mean. You, you for mean you get the opposite. Okay. Good. So we have the final theorem, right? So optimal policies exist, and the value can be characterized in these two ways: one as limit of discounted games, value in the discounted games; two as this average subtle operator. Okay. Good. So, uh, well, okay. So let me give some comments about this. So if you do this proof a little bit more precisely. Then you can actually um, get some rates of convergence and stuff like this. So we can Patterson prove that you know not only is the value of the mean payoff gain, this is the value of the mean payoff gain, the limit, right? Actually, you have this convergence. It converges at one, as one minus gamma. Okay, right? This this goes to zero after okay, one minus gamma, right? So so that's the estimate of how fast does the value of the discounted gain go to the mean payoff gain, the value of the mean payoff gain. And you know, if you do this the proof for the black hole threshold, you know, a little bit more precisely with estimating all of these intervals and stuff like this, you get that the black hole threshold of the of the well, I, I said discounted by of a game, right? 
the black hole threshold of a game is not greater than this number. So the, so the important thing about this number is, is that you can write it in polynomial dimension bits. Okay, so what's the corollary? Is that the problem of finding the optimal policies of mean pair of games reduces to solving this kind of games, right? So if you want to find optimal policies, what you can do? Well, just say this count rate higher than this. So you will find black hole optimal policies. Black hole optimal policies are optimal in the mean pair of game. Go. Okay. Uh, so that's a reduction from mean payoff to discount. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it seems, at least I don't know uh, the answer, is that the opposite reduction is an open problem. That I, I haven't seen a reduction from deterministic discounted to deterministic mean pair of games. But, uh, but you can discount, you can reduce them to stochastic mean pair of games. There is a reduction from deterministic stochastic to deterministic to, to stochastic mean pair of, and from stochastic mean pair of to, to, to stochastic mean pair of. Somehow, mean pair of no uh, discounted games with discount factor gamma or something like one over one minus gamma steps of. Mean payoff games. Right, so if you apply f n one one over one minus n time, if you apply f to the n where n is one over one minus n, mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. the okay. yeah, I I don't know. Well, okay, I haven't like. Thought about it like super super long, but but it's just a curious observation that you know there are all of these reductions like in this paper of Anderson and Milton, which is really just about the reductions, right? And they never spoke speak about the reduction from between deterministic discounted and deterministic mean payoff. I have just never seen this in the literature. It seems like you know people just you know you know they study the class of, of games that interest them, but they like did this question like didn't cross minds or. I don't know. Okay, never mind. Or maybe they think that if you find an algorithm for one, then everything will fall. Okay. Um, but, but okay. So, so in theory, this could be this mean payoff could be slightly slightly simpler than this counted. Maybe. Is maybe. Anything about the brightness of this second one and the significance of Um well, it's probably not tight because they do this in the stochastic case and like just copy to the bound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess that in the deterministic you can you can squeeze something better. But it's still the inverse exponential. Yes, yes, it's the inverse exponential. And there's a funny thing about this. But you see that even if this is two, this is exponential. Right. And it's and, oh, and, nice. and this is not not easy to to actually to actually see. But I think it's actually tight. Even if you plug in w equals to two, then this is exponential. Even for very small payoffs, you can make a complicated example such that you. Payoffs in that. But integer small? Yeah, yeah, integer, small integer payoffs, yes. Even in small integer payoffs, you, can, you, you need a long time to decide which strategy is black or optimal. No, but that's because. Uh... Oh, black hole, black hole optimal. Yeah, yeah black hole optimal. But black hole optimal. If you just want optimal, then that's not the case. If you just want optimal, then the then the bound uh, is uh, just n n to the cube times w. But if you want black hole optimal, then it has to be two to the n times w. We don't know are you getting a black optimal strategy for constant weights or weights that are one, two, three, four, five, or minus black optimal. Black optimal for weights that are one, two, three, four, five. Yes. <laughs> um <laughs> well, good question, maybe I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> this has to be known. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, people do. people don't ask themselves such a question, I guess. No, no, but it's it's a question that I ask myself, you know, when I see this estimate, what happens if W is two? And then, I, uh, but it's really not, not easy to see that this has to be exponential. Uh, it requires you to see that, you know, there are these complicated polynomials that have complicated convergence, it's not like that. I mean, it's, it's, not, not, it's, it's not trivial, so, but I don't know. Yeah, black hole optimal for one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's one of these things that is like a bit hard, right? <clears throat> because there are a lot of this. What can you do? Well, you can find a bias, right? That's for sure. But can you find a black hole bias? And, um... right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's the thing. Uh, okay, so we are approaching the two hour mark. Um, okay, so let me finish finish this uh, about the theory, right? So, uh, well, the corollary is that the problem of deciding if this gamma is positive in the mean pair of gain is also in UP and CoUP. But in this, you do this by reduction, right? Take the value of the, this, this discounted game with sufficiently high discount factor as your certificate, right? So now it's a certificate for the discounted game. So out of that, you get the optimal policies in the discounted game, which are Blackwell optimal, which you can check. Okay, so this gives you a unique certificate even for a mean payoff by reducing to the discounted. So the problem of solving this is open and here are the results that we can uh, we know about mean payoff games. So they can be solved in the polynomial type. So in polynomial in W, but not the log of W, right? You need N log W bits to specify the, the graph. And we can use this in NW operations. So it's exponential in the, the number of bits, but polynomial in the dimension. So this is what's called pseudo polynomial. This is not by reduction to the discounted uh, No, no, I, I have slides on the algorithm. So. so that's why they can also be solved in randomized sub exponential time. You just reduce the discounted game. And you solve it the del and as I told you, the number, and now it's important to know that the number of arithmetic operations doesn't depend on the discount factor. So even though your discount factor is huge, the number of arithmetic operations doesn't depend on it, so it's sub-exponential. And there is this very well studied subclass of mean payoff games called parity games, important for people from, from logic. And we know that these parity games can be solved in quasi polynomial time. So something like n to the log n. Okay. Well, this are the really it's a model checking problem. Yeah, it's a model checking yeah. problem. Yeah. Can be expressed in these games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. This is this is also my entire knowledge about this. I know that this is, it's equivalent. But what does it mean? Okay. So, so when you say arithmetic properties. Repeating any complicated multiplication with the constant. Yeah. Oh no, but you can bound the weights in the intermediate. Yeah, but you know, but the but yes, but the you know the the number of bits is nice, and you know when you do the algorithm, uh, you don't operate on numbers that are like much higher in this, bits. Does the statement that uh, you can solve it in time in different number does this only imply that? There are only finitely many phases that uh, well, I don't know what's in one. We but know that, we know that the, like there was black hole, there's a black hole phase at the end. Yes. Yeah, sure. And there are only finitely many phases. Mm -hmm. Does yep. that follow already from the fact that you can uh, solve this in time? Because it kind of seems like you're not really looking at gamma completely.
Gamma precision doesn't matter. No, but you don't mean like that. I mean, at some precision, you can stop. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah. You don't need half infinite. Yeah. It's already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yes, in fact, yeah. Um, okay, so so that was the part about the theory. So now I have algorithms. Um, so do we do we want to stay yeah, for so half an hour or something? Four. We can do another day, or we can do it alone. Um, I have energy for another hour. Um, yeah, I can make him. I can go on. But uh, how long will it take? No, algorithms should be should be relatively okay, and we can maybe talk about smooth analyzers the other day. Uh, okay, but how much is like, let's say, in your estimate? In the slides, yeah. quite a bit. No, but I mean, uh, how long will it take to come at the rates that we think of? Because if you tell me, oh, it's another yeah. two hours, I'd say, well, then let's stop now and do, do them some other time. It's, if if I want to go to the end, then yeah, it will take two hours. But only two hours. Okay. Yeah, I think we can do, yes, I think so, yes. Okay, should, should. Take a break. Sure. Do you want to continue tomorrow? Sure. Is that good for you then? How long should you have? You want to go with this or you want to go with this? Yeah, so we, we, can, we can do this, right? So the, the second part will be about algorithms and smooth analysis. Perfect. It's perfect, perfect. We did the other. Uh, can we see the other thing now? Because we're not going to have better numbers tomorrow. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, let's do that. Let's, let's just, could you give us like this, a brief overview so that okay. it will be easier to digest next tomorrow? Okay, so uh, do you want to see the slides, right? So basically, we have a brief overview is that we will first talk about one player case. And we will see that in the one player case, we can solve things in polynomial time. So there, is, there are algorithms for uh, discounted games, for instance, based on uh, linear programming. And uh, there are games uh, for mean payoff games. It goes to the result of card about solving uh, mean weight problems. And then the second kind of algorithm that we can do is, is value iteration. So this is already what we've seen for uh, discounted games. It's about iterating the Shapley operator. And what can we what can we deduce out of this? And for mean payoff games, it's again about this iterating the Shapley operator and dividing by n. And what uh, what can we deduce from this? And the third kind of algorithms that are there are policy iteration algorithms. So this uh, is more complicated, more sophisticated, let's say, kind of an algorithm that tries to find optimal policies by optimizing the policies, going through from non-optimal policies to optimal policies. So here is the, the there is this more theoretical part of this, where we define what does it mean to take a policy and make it better? How can we make an algorithm out of that? Why this algorithm stops and is correct? What are the different policy iterating rules that this algorithm could, employ, could, improve, could employ. Uh, what do we know about the complexity of a given rule? So this was for discounted game. What is more complicated in mean payoff game? So in mean payoff game, the policy iteration is a much more tricky algorithm. So there are all of these things that we can do for mean payoff games in order to solve some of these issues that we are going to see. Uh, so then, okay, I will discuss some theory, why it works, why it doesn't work, what kind of policy iteration do we have, and then we have the smooth analysis. Okay, is that fine? So we have one player games, value iteration, policy iteration, I will tell you what all of this is, and then uh, how to do smooth analysis. Okay, so uh, now what should I stop, and how should I stop? I'll, I'll stop there quickly.